Back to the map drawing boards and calls to return to remote learning. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Joe Ingalls, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Herb Asher, OSU political scientist, and Michael Miller, former Franklin County prosecutor. The Ohio Supreme Court basically used simple math to decide to invalidate legislative maps drawn by Republicans this fall. A split court ruled newly drawn maps for state House and state Senate districts and the map for congressional districts all violate the state constitution. The court ruled if roughly half of Ohio voters are Republican, then the legislative maps cannot favor Republican candidates by a three to one margin. That's what the rejected maps did. Justices who dissented argued the maps met the letter of the Constitution and the court was overstepping its authority in nullifying the districts. The court gave the Ohio Redistricting Commission 10 days to come up with new state maps and state lawmakers 30 days to come up with a new congressional map. Herb Asher, you're, Herb Asher, you're, a, long, you're a veteran of these long fights. You've been involved in this for a long time. This was not entirely unexpected. What, if anything, surprised you about these rulings? Herb Asher. I think we expected that uh, with the Chief Justice having indicated that she was opposed to gerrymandering, and she said that many times, that she and the three Democrats would form a four to three majority to declare both the state seats and the congressional seats unconstitutional. So the ruling wasn't that much of a surprise. And when they actually drafted these plans, there were comments from the governor and maybe the Senate president saying, well, I'm sure we're gonna see you back in court. I mean, they, they weren't very confident about the product they produced. So I think this was a ruling that we expected and it's the right ruling. It really is the right ruling. It, uh, it, it's taking into account that the voters supported constitutional amendments that call for a change in the system. The maps currently do not reflect that very well but they in fact can modify these maps to better reflect what the voters were voting for in those constitutional changes. Joe Ingalls, they actually used the governor's words that in the, the lawyers who in the concurring opinion, in the, in the opinion, they used Governor DeWine's words and Secretary of State Frank LaRose's words saying they didn't like this map, but they voted for it anyway. Those, those words came back to, to hurt the supporters of this map in the decision. Yeah, they did use those words in the decision, but they also there was also a very strong argument made by the justices who uh, made this ruling, saying that basically they felt the will of the voters was just thrown out. You know that that the lawmakers who put this together that they weren't following the spirit of what voters passed, and even um, if you look at the ruling, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, who was the swing vote in all of this, really. Uh, she's retiring at the end of this year. She is Republican. But she's retiring. She's a, a more of an independent-minded uh, person uh, on court. And uh, she said that, you know, the people who are behind the reform efforts and brought the reform efforts forward, they might want to think about, you know, going back to voters again to try to fix it. Yeah, like, like Miller, let's go to Sharon Kennedy. She wrote the dissent. She writes, the remedy provided by the Constitution may not please all Ohio voters, but this court does not have license to demand by judicial fiat the adoption of the new General Assembly plan. We'll get to Maureen O'Connor's quote in, in just a moment, but Mike Miller on the Sharon Kennedy's quote first. Uh, do, you, do you agree with her? Did, did, the, co did, did the court overstep its, uh, overstep its, bo of its, of its uh, role here by throwing out these maps, do you think? I know I don't think they've overstepped their role. I'm just saying that when this thing comes up, when these issues come before the court, it isn't as black and white as everybody may want to appear. One side, yeah, we should win. The other side, we should win. You're talking about a delicate thing here. And, and when they say you're supposed to draw this map in an attempt to do some things, you know, what is an attempt? Uh, how close do we come? Uh, I, I just think it is difficult. Is there kind of inbred prejudice, if you will, for the uh, uh, majority party? I, I think that's true. And I don't think it makes any difference if you are a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, we've seen, as I mentioned a number of times on this program, years gone by, and I know Herb's aware of it, when uh, the Republicans and the Democrats had a deal worked out, that everybody was happy. 
And then the Democrats decided as the time came close to finalizing the deal, wait a minute, we're going to win this election. So we don't want this. We, we want to win this election and draw it our way. And so they turned it down and they lost the election. And that's been quite a while. And, and did that surprise me? Of course not. It, it's just a natural thing. If you're drawing the lines, you're trying to slant things as best you can uh, in the eyes of the law uh, to get in your favor and yet still proper. And the Supreme Court has said it isn't proper. And uh, interesting enough that you know, the one Republican decided this, that broke broke ranks, if you will. And I can't say the decision's bad, but had it gone the other way, I don't think I could have said that was bad either, because it's uh, an, it's not something that leans itself to an absolute certainty. Yeah, it was, you know, they had, they, they had to explain three times what the word attempt means. <laughs> that tells you yes. how, how vague this thing is. Let's get to Maureen O'Connor's quote, which raised a, a few eyebrows. She had a quote at the end of her concurring opinion that said, having now seen firsthand the redistricting commission comprised of statewide elected officials and partisan legislators is seemingly unwilling to put aside partisan concerns as directed by the people's vote, Ohioans may opt to pursue further constitutional amendment to replace the current commission with a truly independent nonpartisan commission that more effectively distances from the redistricting process, distances the process from partisan politics. Herb Asher, it sounds like she's telling you and other supporters of further anti-gerrymandering procedures to go back to the ballot. Well, what she's saying is that uh, she may not be around much longer to, uh, uh, to save our necks, so to speak. Uh, she actually, I think, has focused on the correct part of the issue. And as everybody has said, the voters made it very clear in those constitutional amendments that this is what we wanted to see. And the Republican members of their commission basically ignored the voters. So what was different about this case is that we actually had constitutional amendments to fall back on to say that this is what's supposed to have been done. And I thought uh, that the majority of four bipartisan majority got it right. What's also interesting, Mike, is that when they were putting together these plans and these amendments, the court was, I think, entirely Republican. And so if you notice, the court of appeal, if you will, here is the Ohio Supreme Court. And Republicans really felt, well, if there were objections to it, let's send it to the Ohio Supreme Court rather than letting Democrats shop around various federal courts to find a friendly court. Well, that backfired on them because uh, uh, the Democrats have picked up three seats in the last couple of elections, and Chief Justice O'Connor is a strong believer in, in getting rid of gerrymandering. Joe Ingalls, what's the next step here? They have 10 days now. It's actually almost a, just about a week until they have to uh, come up with a new state legislative map for the House and Senate in the, in the, at the Ohio State House, and then another month for the congressional map. Do we expect to see maps that are a whole lot different? Republicans are still in charge. Do we expect to see maps that are a whole lot different than the ones that got rejected? Well, um, let's put it this way. We had better see maps that are different than what were out there before, or the court is going to step in. I mean, the court was very clear saying that they wanted, in, in the congressional map, they actually outlined in, the, in their um, ruling how they wanted it changed, what was structurally wrong with it, what needed to be fixed. And so they're looking for those changes and they're telling lawmakers, either you fix it and bring it back, you know, so that we it's, it's in good shape or, you know, you're going to you're still going to be out of out of bounds with this. So yeah. and the clock uh, is, is running. The filing deadline for candidates for these districts is uh, February 2nd. Right. So just a couple of weeks away. Our next topic, the Omicron surge continues in Ohio. The state is averaging about 20,000 new cases a day. And those are the cases we know about. A lot of the home tests go unreported. So if you look at the glass as being half full, while the case rate remains high, it has flattened over the past week or so. And while the hospitalization rate is high, it has not spiked like the case rate has. The state is shifting its testing strategy. The National Guard continues to help at hospitals. And when it comes to new mandates, still none from Governor DeWine in the U.S. Supreme Court this week. 
rejected President Biden's mandate for large employers. Joe Ringles, let's start with this flattened curve. It's a high curve, but it's flat. Other states are seeing Omicron cases decline. Is that hopeful that this we could be on the back end of this? Well, we're not really sure it's flat because, as you pointed out, there are a lot of tests out there that aren't showing up because people don't report them. But the other thing is today, when you look at the, the most recent numbers, there are over 40,000, which is way high compared to the others. But the reason they're high is there's data processing problems and they don't get put in when they should be put in. Backlog, so for yeah. the next few, there's a backlog. Yes. So for the next few days, those numbers are going to be really high. Uh, like Miller, how, how do you see this uh, Omicron? Do you do you see like the, the the president's mandate got shot down this week on employee employers with 100 or more employees through OSHA? They don't have to mandate their employees get vaccinated. A lot of business groups applauded that. Where do you think what do you think happens now? Do you support that ruling? Well, again, Mike, I hate to be wishy-washy on this thing, but I read the Supreme Court opinion again, and we've got a split on that. Turns out to be 6-3 uh, on party lines. Um, I guess what the Supreme Court said in that case, as I understand it, is, look, uh, the uh, Secretary of Labor doesn't have this authority, and and Congress can't never gave the uh, authority under the Act to do this. I think the Act has been in effect something like 50 years, and uh, they're just saying you can't do what they want to do. You cannot give this authority uh, to come in and say we're going to affect, I think the Supreme Court says, 84 million people in getting shots, not getting shots, or losing their job, and so forth. That the state can do that, but this one can't, unless it's mandated by, passed by Congress. And even then, the Supreme Court says, you know, even then, there may be a question because you may de be delegating your constitutional duties to somebody else, another uh, entity. So, you know, I don't know whether it's good or bad. Um, I suppose the people that, uh, uh, I said a quote from the attorney general said, you know, the pan pandemic's bad, but we got to keep our constitution. He looks at it that way. I don't think I look at it quite uh, that strongly. Uh, but again, I don't know that there's a really answer to this. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you feel that more people will get sick and more people will die because of this ruling? without the mandates for folks to get vaccinated? Well, I suppose um, that may be true. I don't know how many people from what the experts that I see seem to say this thing is peaking and as long as you uh, have any vaccination, you'll be all right. And those 84 million people, remember a lot of them are already vaccinated and boosters and everything else. But you know, Mike, if we're gonna say, you know, an extra 10 people or 20 people or 50 people are gonna die, if, if that's what happens, can we stop that? Yes, I suppose we can or greatly reduce it. But, uh, you know, you shut down everything. Yeah, absolutely. The economy goes, everything. You don't leave your house. So obviously there's a balancing yeah. effect. Nobody wants either one of those extremes. Yeah, we've heard estimates of as high as 250,000 people by some because of the lack of a vaccine mandate. But let's, obviously let's hope that does not happen. Uh, Herb Asher, uh, how do you think this goes? I mean, we're moving the test now from distributing at libraries to going right to schools. And we'll get to schools in a moment, the, the learn at home uh, controversy, but we want to keep the schools open. Do you support that idea of moving the test to the, to the schools to keep uh, kids yeah, in classrooms? Yeah, I, I think, well, it's not unanimous by any means. Uh, I think most people would say students are better off going to school in person and not doing it virtually. Obviously, the teachers unions in some communities are concerned about that. They're concerned about the safety of teachers and the safety of students. But I think, you know, I think there's a broader consensus. Let's have the kids back in school and let's take those measures that we need to take, whether it's testing or masking or social distancing or better ventilation. Let's take all those steps to make the schools as safe as possible. But I think we recognize here that in the United States and certainly in Columbus, the schools actually play for certain parts of our community a much more expanded role than simply teaching. They're yeah. providing nutrition and health care and safety and things like that. So I think uh, I, I think there's a broad but not, uni not uni universal consensus 
schools should be open, but they should be safe. Well, let's expand on that a bit. COVID does continue to cause problems in the schools. Teachers, students, and bus drivers are testing positive and calling in sick. There are not enough substitute teachers and bus drivers. Cleveland and Cincinnati schools have both opted for district-wide remote learning this month. Columbus City Schools is using a school-by-school -school approach with a handful of schools going remote each day. The district closed 19 schools on Friday. Many members of the Columbus Teachers Union this week called on the entire district to go to remote learning for two weeks. The district so far has said no. Mike Miller, where do you stand on this? Should the, should, do you like this school-by-school -school approach? Is that the way to go for Columbus? Well, first of all, I agree with what Herb said. I think the best thing is uh, that students, uh, the kids go back to school and not have, have it handled virtually, if unless there's some overwhelming reason not to do that. Uh, I have a great deal of uh, questions when it comes to the uh, teachers union. Uh, they seem to want to run everything and do these things. I, if, if the experts are saying we can have this and it's safe, and most of them seem to be saying that as far as I'm concerned, then the teachers union comes in and interesting and it's Columbus, Chicago, all over. They take a different position. And I frankly sometimes wonder uh, if the position, the reason they're taking a position is the reason they say. I, I have some doubts about that. Yeah, the teachers are saying that it's not fair that they get late notice, they get notified at seven o'clock the night before that they have to switch their plan to to uh, going remote. That's one of the main uh, concerns they have in addition to the safety concerns. Joe Ingalls, what's happening at, at the state level? I know the governor has said he's not gonna issue a, a statewide mask mandate for school students. Wh where is the state Department of Education and the governor's office on in all this? Well, the State Department of Education actually on their most recent dashboard, uh, less than 30% of school districts have all of their students wearing masks in the classroom. So you've got a lot of students out there who aren't wearing masks and you've got uh, people coming in with COVID. That's a big concern. They've changed the priorities now at the state level so that these tests that you used to get for free at the libraries and the health departments, the antigen tests, now those are going to be given to the schools, the colleges, the universities first, libraries, um, you know, when whenever they get enough tests out there, then they'll go back to handing them out to the general public in the libraries. Um, but for right now, these uh, at-home rapid tests are so hard to get that a lot of people uh, say they can't find them, they can't get them, they haven't been able to get a PCR test at one of the many mass testing sites that they have around the state, which they keep expanding, by the way. Um, and so a lot of people aren't even testing right now. And you've got to remember that anything that happens in the school is a reflection of the community at large. Yeah. So if community spread is a, a problem, it's going to be a problem in the school as well. Yeah, we're almost back to where we were in March of 2020, where we run enough tests and the, and the numbers really couldn't trust the, the testing, the case numbers, because people were getting sick and weren't getting tested. Her back to the politics of this, you know, Mike Miller mentioned that the power of the teachers union. Democrats are kind of stuck in that, you know, they want to help their teachers and they support teachers and teachers unions. So they don't want to, you know, make them too mad. But on the other hand, they don't want to make mad the parents, particularly suburban parents who they've won over over the past few years, who may have been voting Republican. They don't want to make them mad. What are, what are Democratic school board members and Democratic mayors, what are they what do they do in this situation? Well, I think uh, we've seen here that Democratic mayors in cities such as Chicago and New York have come out very strongly in saying the school should be open and the mayor of Chicago basically has taken on the union. So I think for the, the elected officials, not on a school board, but mayors, council people, I think they're saying, and again, this is not true across all communities, but they're saying it's in the best interest of our city, the parents and the children, to have the schools open. Unions, work with it. Let's be flexible. Tell us what you need. What do we have to do to make the situation safer? But they're not going, many of them are not going to accept the union simply saying no. Yeah, and we'll see how that plays out in the, in the months to come. Hopefully this, this surge is short. Our last topic, we are starting to get a sense of where the Republican race for U.S. Senate stands, campaigns and their supporters are releasing internal polls 
Now, we have to take this data with a grain of salt because campaigns tend to only tout polls that make their candidates look good. That being said, there is a pattern. Josh Mandel leads by varying amounts. Jane Timken is not too far behind. Businessman Mike Gibbons has moved towards the top, and J.D. Vance is still competitive, although he seems to have fallen a bit. Uh, Joe Ingalls, you look at these numbers and you see f at least four very strong candidates. I don't see any of those folks leaving the race anytime soon as we get close to the primary. Do you? No. And, and if you look at what's happening is that the candidates who are not the top two are going after the top two. Uh, recently, we've seen Mike Gibbons put out an ad um, disparaging J.D. Vance. Uh, we've seen other ads out there, by the way, from other candidates, and it seems like now it's, it's starting to get real. Now, you know, people are starting to actually think about the primary and who they're going to vote for. And you can tell that in the uh, fervor coming from the candidates as well. You're seeing more of them in more places. You're seeing more advertising and you're seeing them hit after each, one, each other a little bit more. Mike Miller, the ads have been running quite a bit, especially on uh, TV stations and networks that appeal to a conser more conservative voter. Um, does that hurt your party in the long run? Because independents are watching those, so moderates are watching those and maybe turned off. Well, I don't know that it hurts the party. Uh, you know, you'd like to have these things go a little more smoothly. I think the Democrats are going to have basically one candidate, and, and that'll be good for them in many ways, money and everything else. Um, but that's the system. That's the way it works. I uh, it, the advertising, uh, at least what I'm seeing, is just given in this, like uh, the other uh, young man, I can't remember his name, no, that has, no. has the ad on, you know, I'm an immigrant or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, ads for uh, Temkin or uh, Mandel or uh, Vance. Uh, so, you know, it's early yet. I think Mandel is probably the best known is why he's at the top right now. Uh, none of the others are particularly well known. Temkin, of course, to some Republicans, but the other one's not. So I think it's way early and uh, many, many days to go. And uh, you're right, Mike, they only, they only le leak things that are benefit beneficial to their own candidacy. So I don't pay a lot of attention, but we've got such a long time to go. Yeah. Um, it's just part of the process. Bernie Moreno is the is the candidate who's running ads, saying he's, yes. a, he's yeah. a legal immigrant, and he is he's kind of far back. He's at he's at five or seven percent. But Herb Asher, Mike Gibbons was down in single digits before he went on a real blitz with a lot of ads, and it helped him. It brought him up into that sort of top sure, tier. Sure. But you know, as some Democrats are watching these ads, they're thinking, you know, the Republicans may just do us a favor and nominate a candidate who is so far to the right that will give a Democratic candidate like a Tim Ryan the opportunity to be stronger than he would have otherwise been had the Republicans had the good sense to go with a, a, a more of a Portman-like candidate. But, uh, and I, you know, I think these ads are important because they're gonna be, they're gonna come back to haunt some of these candidates. When, when Gibbons says, well, voting has to be on election day in person, no more uh, mail and absentee voting, but a lot of people realize what that means for them, uh, they're not gonna be happy about that. And of course, if the virus is still rampant, they're not gonna be happy about that. And, uh, and Marino has gotten further and further to the right in terms of how he's trashing immigrants. And even though he's trashing illegal immigrants, it really comes across as a really nasty set of things. And you know that could backfire on them in the general election. Yeah, Joe Ingalls, really quickly, J.D. Vance has been the target of a lot of ads. You get the feeling that he is, he was a, he's a candidate that a lot of these Ohio folks, traditional Ohio folks, are afraid of. Yeah, because he came in with a huge war chest. He has the backing of Peter Thiel, uh, the, the big Silicon Valley uh, funder who goes out and funds uh, campaigns. And, and you know, J.D. Vance uh, had the movie and he had his book. And, you know, so people kind of know who he is. They don't know a lot about him. But the problem is that uh, as this campaign has gone on, more people have been able to define J.D. Vance the way they want to define him. And uh, that is not exactly a good thing for him. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, pro probably what you're seeing in the polls. All those mean things he said about Donald Trump coming back to haunt him and others in this campaign. It's time now for our off the record final parting shots. And Mike Miller, you're first. Well, I think the uh, High Supreme Court ruling on the um, 
gerrymandering and the congressional districts and so forth, this is not going to be an easy thing to do. I, I can't imagine everybody coming together within the 10 days or whatever that limit is and uh, placating everyone. The Supreme Court says this is fine. I think it's going to be very delicate. I hope I hope they work it out. I hope both parties work together and work something out uh, because it has to be done at some point. Uh, if they turn it down again, I don't know where we turn to, okay. but okay. hopefully that will not happen. Herb Asher, 30 seconds. Uh, first, congratulate the people who brought the redistricting issue to the stage where it is today and organizations like the League of Women Voters, individuals like uh, Dick Gunther and Peg Rosenfield. But I disagree a little with Mike. I think actually it'd be very easy to, in 10 days to come up with a solution. The map making is easy. They have those maps already. They just didn't offer them up. Okay. And so the question becomes, will you be willing to settle for, you know, something between 58 and 64? Joe Ingalls, real quickly. Okay, well, the end school learning, a lot of schools don't have masks. They don't have mask policies. Without that, are the tests going to be enough to keep kids in school? We're already seeing high absentee rates, and I'm looking to see how this actually plays out now that you're not going to have tests in the community as you once did. All right, Jennifer Bruner, Sharon Kennedy, justices on the court, both running for chief justice, both wrote opinions in this case. These cases look for this issue to be an issue in their upcoming campaign. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Our website is wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.